Shadow Verse. Greetings, I'm Shad, and I want to clear up some misconceptions about medieval horses. Now, the first thing that I want to address is the idea of the classic war horse. And I have come across some people who assume that the knight's horse, the war horse, must have been this incredibly huge beast. And seeing, you know, movies and stuff, having knights be uh, seated on what looked to be uh, impressive, yet standard riding horses. No, 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 these should be massive beasts, Clydesdales, in fact. An actual fact, um, no, no, uh, the standard medieval horse was actually a little bit smaller than the standard horses that we see in the modern day, okay? Horses are generally bred to be uh, large and powerful, good at riding and for speed, of course. And the more that you do that breeding, the more, uh, I guess, accentuated those features become. And so the more you go back in history, the smaller horses actually become. So much so, when you go really far back in history, yeah, like to the classical period and even a bit before, horses, they're kind of like the size of ponies. And if you go further back, they're quite small. Like horses like this big, aren't there? And uh, like certain uh, prehistoric times, like I'm not too well educated on the status of horses in really far back. What I want to talk about more specifically are the horses of the medieval period. Because this is significant, horses were quite important in the medieval period for many tasks, okay? If you wanted to get from one location to another location in a short amount of time, you know, when you wanted to travel over a large distance with speed, well, a horse was kind of your go-to I was going to say tall. It's not really a tall. It's an animal. They're useful for transporting goods. They're useful in farming and they're also useful in warfare. And for these different kind of uses, we see different medieval classifications for horses. Now, something that should be uh, noted and is important to understand about these uh, classifications is that uh, it's hard to determine how universal they really were. Were these names used for every location, you know, in the medieval period, medieval Europe, uh, for every time period? Obviously not. That's not how language works. Yet, for, say, a couple of these classifications, and I'll use an example of one of them, that, which we will elaborate more and I'll teach you more about, say the Destrier. Well, the word Destrier is a word referring to a horse that actually appears in several languages. Middle English, Anglo-Norman, Old French, Italian, and Latin, <laughs> okay? Now, all these kind of uh, words for Destria are very similar with slight differences, but they're clearly kind of, well, they're, they're saying the same thing. Like in Italian, it was Destrieri or Destriero or something like that, but, but very slight variants, and sometimes no variants, they just, just said the same. And so this is a classification that's appearing in multiple languages, which can inform us that it was used for multiple uh, locations throughout medieval period. The other important thing to understand about these classifications is that they do not refer to breeds of horses, okay? They actually refer to the role in which the horse is good at fulfilling. If a horse is like, okay, this horse is good at this, that means it is this type of horse, all right? So that's where, how these classifications work. Now, what are these classifications? Because they're really interesting and they're very useful. And if you're wanting to depict a medieval period accurately, it's good to understand them and use them. Now, could there be other classifications that were not as prominent and sometimes used differently in different languages? I'd say it's very high likelihood there are. So don't think that this is the exhaustive list. I'm kind of just sharing the more prominent and common ones that seem to have been used in the medieval period. And they are Destria, Corsa, Palfrey, Rouncy, and Stumpter. Quick public service announcement, I've actually mispronounced this word. It is not stumpter, it is actually sumpter. I don't know why I put the T in there, but I don't know, I'm an idiot. So whenever I say stumpter, it's wrong. It, it's, yeah, it's supposed to be sumpter. I'm glad that's been sorted out. Back to the video. I'll start at the bottom and work our way up because at the bottom you see the more common type of horses and then they become a bit more specialized as we go up to the, uh, the Destria, okay? The uh, less common but big, like most expensive and impressive kind of horse in this regard. So the Stumpter is a classification that basically refers to a horse that's a pack animal, okay? It's a pack horse, essentially. Uh, just using goods, uh, carrying loads and everything, maybe even pulling a plow in some instances. So if a peasant has a horse, it's probably common for it to be a type of Stumpter, okay? Uh, and this could be any number of breeds, but it's basically a horse that isn't raised 
well enough to be uh, good at certain tasks like riding, speed, or combat, but it can carry loads, okay? So that's that's it, that's a stumpter. Now, if you go a little bit above a stumpter, that's because a stumpter is kind of a, a cheap, you know, horse, but if you go above that, that's a better kind of standard horse that isn't particularly, you know, being raised for uh, specific special specialty uses like uh, long distance riding or speed or, or combat. Well, this type of horse would be called a Rouncy. Now, Rouncy is basically a standard all purpose type of horse. Now, if you raised a horse that was particularly dedicated for riding, okay, if you're wanting to get from one location to another for, you know, riding for long periods of time, so it obviously has a strong level of fitness associated with and stuff like that, this is the type of horse that you would call a palfrey, which is a, a better, more dedicated riding horse. And they were particularly valued as a riding horse. So if you're actually a uh, higher up nobility, okay, and and you wanted a horse that was dedicated for riding, you wouldn't pick a more expensive horse that was trained and raised for combat. Much higher chances that even the nobility would pick a palfrey. This is your riding horse. But then we move up another kind of step or a narrow the uh, margin of what these horses were employed for a little bit more and we do come into the realms of combat. But just a quick note on the palfrey, I'm not saying that they were the only horses ever used for riding. I'm, of course, they are, you know, a courser, which is the one we're talking about now, could be used for riding as well. But when it comes to combat, the courser is the classification that seems to define uh, the standard war horse of the medieval period. Now remember, these aren't breeds, these are horses that were fit for the purpose of these classifications. So when it comes to warfare, you need a horse trained for the role because horses by nature are very skittish animals. And so there are some very specific and important things that you want a horse to be trained to do to handle uh, combat essentially. So to not uh, get frightened, okay, and stuff like that when you're getting attacked, to uh, stay controlled and obey the rider, but also to be able to perform uh, important and specific uh, maneuvers, okay? If you can rotate the horse on a dime, get it to prance when you want it to prance, get it to charge when you want it to charge, get it to redirect, get, uh, basically obey your orders, okay? And so if you have a horse that's been trained and raised to do this, regardless of breed, it would be classified as a courser. So if you're saying this is a courser, you're saying this horse is fit for combat. But there is a type of horse that is basically considered the best type of horse for combat, okay? And they weren't hugely common, they weren't everywhere. So if you had this type of horse, they were one, really expensive, okay, this is a really valuable horse, and two, they were a bit more rare, okay, and three, they were really good at the dedicated combative arts of the medieval period, and that is the Destrier. Destriers were considered the strongest type of war horse and were usually stallions. And in case you don't know that, that means a male horse. So specifically, a male horse that has its nads intact, okay? Uh, a male horse that has been castrated is called a gelding, and a female horse is a mare. Of course, it makes sense that destriers were commonly stallions, because stallions have a bit more, uh, uh, let's call it hormonal energy, uh, than geldings and mares. And just to let you know, a mare specifically refers to a female horse over the age of three, where if they're under the age of three, they're called a filly, and a young male horse is a colt. Lots of, lots of definitions and terms in this equine subject. Destriers were also considered the most well-suited horse for the joust. So medieval tournaments, which obviously makes sense because if it's best suited for war, uh, it probably gives you certain advantages in jousting as well. They were renowned for their quick speed, their ability to quickly stop as well, coil, spring, spin, turn. Now to give you a point of comparison as to how valued a Destrier was to say other horses, in the county of Flanders in 1297, one Destrier was worth seven palfreys, okay, which is your standard riding horse of the medieval period. Now, of course, you do have to remember that prices and value would have changed, but generally the Destria was always more valued. There are some different accounts where a Destria was valued at four times the cost of a regular horse. So there we go. These are the general classifications for medieval horses. And even if you don't want to fully adapt these classifications to your story, fantasy, or whatever, and you wanted to make up your own classifications or names for the 
other classifications. What we can be informed from history are the different groups horses were placed in based on their value and what they did. And so you could call the standard riding horse in whatever sitting you're doing a different name, but generally a good standard riding horse is they were kind of grouped together regardless of breed. Same with the levels of war horses. And there was a difference between a good standard war horse and the best war horse. So you could name them whatever you want, but I actually think keeping the classifications would be useful and very realistic and immersive. Or if you're wanting to be fully immersive to the medieval period, you can keep the names of these classifications as well. Well, and they were the Destria, the Corsa, the Palfrey, the Rouncey, and the Stumpter. Very, very cool stuff, very intriguing. Thank you for watching. I do hope you've enjoyed, and of course, I hope to see you again. So until that time, farewell.